Okay, cheers. Uh, fantastic. Uh, thanks very much, Sam. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about a fair price for perpetual utility. Um, okay, so let's start by breaking that down a little bit to see what I'm talking about. Uh, so first of all, utility. Uh, what we're talking about here uh, from the user perspective is the expectation that we're going to get something at some time in the future. From the perspective of the storage provider or the network, this is what block rewards are earned for uh, in, in, in proportion to the, the utility that's supplied. So, I mean, I, I work uh, as a long-term collaborator with Protocol Labs, so I'm particularly uh, interested in Filecoin, which is an L1 that provides storage as a utility. But uh, more generally, you can also think um, think about off-chain compute, which is something that's also coming to Filecoin, but also other things, for example, networking or perhaps even attention. Okay, so what about perpetual? Uh, so in a sense, this is just marketing talk. Uh, perpetual is a is a it's a long way. Uh, I mean, let's try to keep things in context. I mean. Uh, we don't really know what's going to be happening in 10 years, never mind perpetuity. So what we're really talking about here is very long-term storage. Uh, this is, however, uh, something that's it's absolutely important and that is completely realistic. For example, on Filecoin, we might be storing some of society's most important data, for example, archiving election results or war crime atrocities. And this is only really useful if you can establish a chain of evidence and have immutability, but also be able to store this data on the timescale of decades to hundreds of years. So this is this is what's motivating long-term storage. Um, so, uh, and in order to do this, we have to be able to incentivize it by having some kind of concept of price. Now, on price, I'm not really going to talk about a number, but I will talk about the different factors that go into uh, informing a, a price. Um, okay. And this kind of comes back to the concept of fairness. So what, what's a fair price? So we can say, okay, a fair price is the market reflection of supply and demand. But whenever we're dealing with something like very long-term storage, how do we know what's fair? We need to be able to assess, um, to have kind of sufficient information to, to make an assessment of what, what, what is a fair price in terms of um, how, how much does the storage provider have to pay uh, to, to provide that storage? And, you know, and this depends on things like hardware costs. You, know, you actually have to have physical disk drives if, you're, if you have a utility token. Um, so understanding and assessing these factors, that, that's, that comes into the concept of fairness. But there's also a, a kind of wider principle here that's it's relevant to Web3 and that I think um, uh, is part of the unique value proposition of, of Web3 is, is really that this kind of concept of transparency and openness that the, the crypto economic systems that we're designing, they're open for everybody to see how they work. So they're not built on this old fashioned model uh, I, you know, I don't know, you have a social network and your data is used and most people have absolutely no idea how it's used. Uh, so, you know, we want to break away from this kind of information asymmetry model. Um, and I, I think that's something that's, that sort of motivates where we're going. So in, in terms of long-term storage, uh, the, the first thing is, is, the, is the mission. This is to store data long-term and this is kind of motivated uh, by fairness. And this gives us a way to think about how we're going to design the principles to do this. And, and these principles, these are encoded through uh, crypto economic incentives. So we're talking here about a carrot and a stick. Yeah, you, you know, if you don't provide storage, your collateral will be slashed. Uh, but if you do uh, provide storage effectively, then um, you, you will be rewarded. Um, and so, I mean, we've got, we've got these different factors here of long-term storage, and you can look at each of these from different perspectives, and we have to try to think about how they interact. And so, next, uh, after this kind of somewhat long-winded introduction, I'll try to look in a little bit uh, more detail at some of these. Um, so, at kind of basic level, we have the crypto-economic incentives, but these are also tied kind of very intricately into other things, such as hardware. Uh, for example, how you treat your hardware depends on how you understand uh, these crypto economic incentives. 
Um, and, and the price that you might give for a deal for very long-term storage, of course, it depends on things like redundancy, like how many copies do I have to keep. Okay, so uh, just a very quick recap on crypto, uh, crypto econ incentives in Filecoin. Uh, so in, in Filecoin, the, the basic incentives are that um, storage providers, which you can think of as miners and other chains, um, they can, they can earn block rewards and they can earn uh, rewards for client deals. But if they don't reliably store that data and it's not retrievable, their collateral will be slashed. Um, so here, here you can see a bunch of uh, fault events uh, on the Filecoin chain. And you can see that, okay, this sector was faulted and then, but the next day it was recovered. So that means that that miner didn't actually have to pay, or sorry, storage provider rather, didn't have to pay a, a fee because they recovered their sector. So this is kind of interesting. Uh, so it, it implies two things, that there's sufficient slackness in the system that storage providers aren't unnecessarily getting penalized, but also it's good for clients in the fact, in the sense that, okay, the sector went down, the storage wasn't available temporarily, but it was recovered, so storage is, is available long term. So that's the kind of basics of the crypto economic incentives. So this kind of feeds into an interesting problem that I was looking at a couple of days ago. So I was at a, a storage mining confer conference in, in Las Vegas, and we we're talking to some of the storage providers, and one of the things that comes up is, okay, so I'll, uh, I, I know I've got these, these incentives where I might get slashed if my disk fails. So what is the optimal policy with regards to whether or not um, I should replace this disk at a given time? So there's, there's a kind of few trade-off factors here and things we need to consider. The, the first thing is that, okay, a disk can fail randomly. So you've got this kind of reliability curve. It's like a bathtub curve in engineering. Um, um, we have to think about, okay, we, we can have a warranty on the disk, so maybe uh, if, if the disk fails within the first two or three years, um, you get a free replacement. But if the, if, the, if the disk fails randomly, then you risk getting slashed and losing uh, collateral. So that's something we want to avoid. But, you know, you can re replace your disk early, and then you're, you're going to have a controlled situation, and you're not going to get slashed. But, of course, then you have to pay for replacing the disk. So you kind of got this kind of interesting trade-off space. Um, so I think one way to think about this is, so we've got random disk lifetimes. And on top of these random disk lifetimes, we have uh, some amount of cost that can be paid. And the amount of cost depends on the precise mode of failure. So I was thinking one way to model this is as a renewal reward process. So I think Barnaby was talking about Poisson processes for arrivals. So in a renewal, new, sorry, excuse me, in a renewal process, we generalize the notion of arrival times to an arbitrary IID distribution. So it doesn't have to be Poisson distributed. And then to make this a renewal reward process, on top of those arrivals, we, we add another dimension, uh, the reward or cost. Uh, so I'm kind of using reward in the, in the generalized sense here. Uh, the rewards will be costs and things that you actually have to pay. So to make a little bit of progress on this, what we can do is use the, the renewal reward theorem here and use this to, to model this scenario. So for the actual distribution, we can just say, okay, I want something that looks like a bathtub. Uh, so we can have uh, like this kind of generalized beta distribution, so a stretched out beta distribution, and that will give us something nice uh, to model the lifetimes. Uh, and then once we have this, we can say, okay, so what's our optimization problem? We want to optimize cost per time. So if we can if we can do this, then we can find the optimal policy to to replace the disk. Um, so. What we want to do is find out an expression for this expected cost and the expected disk lifetime on the bottom. And you can't really do this directly alone. But what you can do is think about the different ways that that cost can occur. So depending on, on what time it, uh, uh, the disk fails relative to when it was planned to be re uh, retired, you can have these different modes of costs that can arise. Um, so this is something that we can work out. Uh, 
and we can we can get the, we get this kind of simple expression here, these expectations, and we can plug in some numbers, and we can actually get a nice little optimization problem. And if we put in, okay, say your warranty is three years, cost of replacing the disc is five hundred, then we can actually come up with a time uh, to say this is whenever you should replace the disc. So, although this is not necessarily designing crypto um, economic incentives, it is part of the kind of bigger picture in the sense of trying to understand what are the consequences further down the line uh, of those crypto economic incentives um, and how, how uh, different players in the system can respond to them. So this one, this is one uh, problem I've been thinking about the past couple of days. Um, and another problem that we can think about is, okay, so how can we actually think about pricing something that um, that it, very very long term into the future. So we can think about okay, what are the underlying factors uh, in something like um, uh, storage? So an underlying factor is of course the hardware. Uh, now Filecoin as a network has only been around uh, for for a year in terms of the a year or two in terms of the live mainnet. So we don't have a lot of data on storage deals. But we do have a lot of data on these kind of underlying factors. This kind of Moore's law uh, thing you've got going on here, where you can see, okay, the price of memory, the price of magnetic disks, these kind of physical things that go into the price of, um, fundamentally feed into the price of Filecoin storage deals. We do have data on these. So how can we use this to inform what the, the price might look like in the future? So the kind of caveat here is, of course, nobody can predict price in the future. But if you want to have some kind of reference, perhaps we can uh, we can kind of borrow some information from these trends in the past of these underlying physical factors and use this to inform what you know at least give a reference for what uh, Filecoin deals might uh, look like. So one one approach to this is you can use a GLM and have some kind of partial pooling of the coefficients. So we're going to say okay. I don't really know what the price of Falcon deals will look like, but they should be somewhat similar in terms of how they change with time to these 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 kind of un, uh, underlying physical factors. So they should have you know similar slopes. So if we do this, we can we can get we can come up with some some kind of reference model. And if you if you wanted to turn this into a price, of course you can integrate uh, you know every single realization of the MCC uh, trajectories for this price. But, you know, this has limitations. This is just one factor, and of course there are, there are multiple factors that really need to go into this. For example, the cost of bandwidth and, the, and, and, and other things. So, just to kind of finish off, uh, another thing I wanted to mention is redundancy. Um, so, Although the Filecoin crypto economic incentives are very good and if faults happen in general, they're recovered from pretty quick. Something we do have to think about is, uh, you know, there, there, there still can be catastrophic fail failures. There can be, I don't know, an earthquake that brings down a data center. So how many um, copies do we need? Um, so, so this is one problem we've had to think about a little bit. Um, and, and you can model this quite simply. I mean, it, it's this kind of combinatorial uh, enumeration, and if we if we know the if we can guess the probability of one copy failing, then we can we can work out this distribution of having multiple copies failing. But really, the, the thing we want to look at first of all is just okay. So, how many copies do we need in order to have a given level of service agreement? So, say we want to have a five nines SLA. I mean. And, and the probability of one one failing is 0 0.1, then then we only really need to store two copies. So this is the kind of thing we've been looking at, which kind of builds in on top of the kind of crypto economic incentive there. Um, so so this is fine, but there's also things that we can do in in order to minimize this as well, to minimize the number of copies we might need. So I don't know, maybe you want a 10, uh, nines SLA, so then you might need to have more copies of the data. So how, how can we uh, make this cheaper for people and more cost-effective? Well, we can have multiple providers across 
uh, different geographic re regions. You're going to store copies with different minor IDs, but you can also think about having a reputation system. So if you look at the distribution of faults, you can see that most storage providers are extremely good, don't have, have very few faults, uh, and some are not so good. So if you have a reputation system, then perhaps you can have a market on top of this. Um, okay, so I think that's most of what I wanted to say. Uh, so I guess just to recap, we have protocol level incentives, but this is only one part of a much wider, more complicated system. And we have to try to understand how all of these different factors interact and uh, work together. So one aspect of this was actually thinking at the hardware level, what's my strategy to renew that hardware? given the crypto economic incentives that we have for storage. Uh, then I looked a little bit at the hardware cost over time and redundancy. Um, and generally, this is, these are, although I haven't given you a price for, for storing something forever, I think these are the type of factors that we need to think about in order to think about a fair price for uh, storing something for a very long time. Um, so. If, it, if anybody has any thoughts on this, uh, I, it would be great to hear that and to, to see what you think is, you know, this doesn't make any sense or perhaps you should be uh, thinking about this instead. So that would be really good. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Cheers. Uh, does anybody have, okay, we have a question already. Is it wrong? Yep, okay. Um, is there anything particular about the way that uh, you're using the data that is different from, let's say, Backup, for example? Because Backblaze, the storage backup company, has a lot of data on hard disk um, failure rates from 2013, which is open source. So I think that that might be a good uh, data source to take as a baseline, and then maybe you can compare whether their, data fa uh, their hard disk failure rates are similar enough that you can maybe use that historical data from 2013 and that might reduce the amount of that you need to collect by, by yourself. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, so I think that's a good idea. So for all different types of hard drives, you have the different, differently shaped failure distributions. Uh, so, I mean, using this model, you can plug in numbers in that parametric distribution for whatever kind of hard drives you're using. Um, but then the kind of, the problem that sits on top of that is, okay, so, You've got this distribution of hard, hardware failure, but you've also got these other constraints, like what's the warranty and what are the cryptographic incentives? And it's, it's really these that uh, you need to think about as well in terms of determining the optimal time to replace the disk. Yeah, Yeah. so what, what they have is they have data on the failure rates. I'm not sure if they have data on the prices as well. I know they do write-ups yeah. on prices. There was a time that they bought external hard drives and stripped them up because yeah. it was better price efficiency. Yeah. So they have the data. I don't know if that is open source. I know the failure rates are open source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be cool. Yeah, it would be good to incorporate that for sure. Yeah. Thanks. Any other? Hi. Uh, yeah. Is this one? Yeah. So you've done that path from the incentives to the time to replace a disk, have you done the opposite where you define the incentive um, parameters like what's the slashing so that people replace disks before they fail? Uh, no, we haven't done that. So we started, I started working on this about two days ago. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we could do that next. So yeah, I mean, that's an really interesting perspective to, to flip it on its head. So that's a really good idea. Yeah. Can I add something to that? Yeah, sure. Um, We actually did, uh, that's a very good question because sometimes the, always, the question always come up, oh, how do you set this parameter, right? So when we are setting the fall fees, the, 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 uh, the thought process was, uh, what would be a break-even price, break-even penalty, given some kind of level of reliability? So for them, then back then we were like, okay, maybe if let's say you are less than 60%, we don't want to be too punitive because otherwise it's like expensive to operate, right? But we, at the same time, we want to maintain some kind of pressure. So back then we were like, okay, why don't we design, why don't we, um, arrive, it's kind of heuristic as well, magic number. Uh, it will only break even if you have at least 60% of reliability. Of course, in, uh, in, uh, we, of course that, that 
um, that bakes in like a buffer of like, oh, we estimate the cost wrong and whatnot, but like that kind of like a framework that we use as well. Or given some notion of like um, your reliability, what would be the penalty structure? All right. Thanks, everybody. Let's thank Tom again. Yeah, cheers. Thank you.